This episode is brought to you by Audible. For a 30-day trial and one free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory. I don't hear a lot of people questioning, like, am I still monogamous, even though I'm not with a partner right now? Good um, point. You know, usually someone who wants monogamy is still pretty clear on like, no, that's what I'm looking for and that's what I want. If you're happy with the same old ways of dating. If you enjoy sucking at communication. And you have no desire to improve your romantic life, then our podcast might not be for you. But if you want some out of the box ideas to deepen your current relationships. Broaden your sexual horizons. Develop a better understanding of yourself. Or learn more about non-monogamy. Then you've come to the right place. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. And this is the Multiamory Podcast. Podcast. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we're talking about the Polyamory Board of Directors who review all applications to become polyamorous, as well as administer quarterly compliance evaluations. This week, we're giving you the top 60 tips for passing your polyamory qualification test. Lies. JK. Like, it's like, so, it's such lies. So many really, lies. Such I lies and hogwash. <laughs> I appreciate like how just straight you were with that though, Jace. <laughs> yeah, you did well. Yeah, you, you didn't did break. Well. It was impressive. Thanks. I actually was tempted to just be like, can we just improv the whole rest of the episode? Oh man. Around <laughs> oh my gosh. Change People would be so plans. angry. Can you even imagine? Oh gosh. Yeah, I, yeah. What would be some of the top 60 tips for passing your polyamory qualification test? Oh my gosh. We should, you know what? We'll save this for the bonus content. Okay. We can Jeez. talk about yeah, that some more. That, that's an Great. interesting question. So, no, instead, we're going to be talking about all of the ways in which people can be polyamorous, even when maybe they feel like, am I polyamorous? Am I not? Like, can I even call myself that? Um, Like, if you are only in a relationship with one person at that moment, or if you have had multiple breakups, um, if you aren't friends with your metamors, stuff like that, or even if you open and close your relationships at certain times in your lives. We're going to be talking about all of that today um, and kind of going through things that we've heard from various people as well as things that we ourselves have experienced. I think it's interesting that this question comes up for people a lot, and I don't know if it's like... um I, I don't know. I think it's funny because it's like, you know, the joke is always that like, you know, millennials hate putting labels on things. But at the same I time, totally I think like... I totally did. <laughs> but, <laughs> Until like but, relatively recently. So yes, guilty as charged. Is, the thing is though, but I think that to a certain extent, millennials do like having labels because I do feel like identity has become such an important thing to understand for oneself and to profess for oneself and to proclaim all over your social media. Um, and I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. Like, I, like I'm not trying to like, you know, throw shade at, at having an identity, but I do feel like it kind of creates an environment where people feel a little bit pressured to be able to, um, I guess, to be able to label their identity or to use multiple labels for their identity. And I think some people are super into that. Some people are super not, but I feel like, it's maybe that context and that pressure that leads some people to be like, am I allowed to say I'm polyamorous in my Twitter bio? Like, I don't know. Yeah, if I'm actually not with multiple partners at one point in time. Yeah, and, right. and surprisingly, I mean, maybe not surprisingly, because we do have a lot of people um, in a lot of different different relationship structures on our uh, Patreon multi-amory Facebook page, uh, that this is, I think, come up from time to time. People asking this question and just even other live shows, I know that we've had various people come up to us and say, you know, I haven't had, I, I call myself polyamorous, but I haven't had a date in a long time, in many months or even years. And it's been really difficult because, you know, you may not have anyone to vouch for you that's already dated you, that you're a great, great partner or anything along those lines. So I get it. I get that all of those things can be really challenging. Well, could I start us off Please. with one particular situation that's definitely happened to me a number of times, which is where we'll do maybe a live show or I will just meet someone who has listened to the podcast and they'll say to me something along these lines. Um, you know, oh, I, you know, I really enjoy your podcast. I think it's really interesting. I would like to be polyamorous, but right now I don't have any partners. Mm. Mm. And usually my answer to that person is you could be polyamorous if you want to, because it's not determined by the number of relationships you have, 
but by what you expect from those relationships and how you conduct yourself in those relationships. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about that? I mean, is there, is there some truth to like, well, I'm not polyamorous yet, but I want to be, or, or can you just be it before you even have even tried it? Well, I think it calls up that same question of, I mean, like, so I'm inclined to, I I think people make this comparison a lot that it's like, well, you can be bisexual or pansexual, but that doesn't mean that you have to be dating people of multiple different gender identities at the same time. Like maybe, maybe you just have one partner who identifies in one particular way, but that doesn't change the fact that you still feel attracted to or drawn to or interested in people of multiple gender identities. Mm -hmm. But then of course the follow-up question to that, it always leads into the debate of like, well, is polyamory or non-monogamy? Is it a sexuality? Is it a sexual orientation? Is it a choice? Is it, you know, like, and I don't want to get into that debate because the fact that it's like, there is no clear answer to that question in, and there probably won't be until there's some kind of hardcore research into that. Um, So I guess for me, I kind of feel like, honestly, like I think that if your principles, um, I don't know. I think it's it's kind of it is kind of like something more inherent, I suppose, where it's like even if you're not dating multiple people at that particular time or if you're single or for whatever, but like if this is what really feels true to you and feels right to you, like I think it's okay to proclaim that identity. Well, both of you discussed principles um it, it, as like a delineation, I guess, between one or the other, between potentially being monogamous or more of that mindset versus a more open or polyamorous mindset. So what are some of those principles or, or thoughts that one would like say is inherently one versus the other? Well, I think what I am talking about when when people will come to me with something like that, what I'm referring to is yes, you might not have any partners right now, but in seeking new partners, mm-hmm, in dating mm-hmm. people, are you beginning that conversation right away with this is how I think about monogamy and non-monogamy, and this is the way that I, you know, want to communicate openly about it, and I expect the same from you, and, you know, I'm not going to, you know, put these limitations on who you can be with, and I'm not going to put those on myself either, right? Like, going in with that, to me, that's kind of the distinction. Yeah. However, um, I mean, I could, I could also make an argument for saying, well, I think I might want to be polyamorous, but I don't know Mm because I haven't tried it yet. And I think that's a little different than like, Mm -hmm. I definitely want to be this, but I'm not yet because I don't have partners versus I think I want this, but I haven't tried it. Yeah. And I saw an article recently on kind of that thing in general, just women specifically in this article were talking about that they had started dating a guy or they had dated multiple men who just used polyamory as an excuse for having sex with multiple women or multiple people and that they actually were married or, or had a girlfriend who had no idea about it and that they were just calling themselves polyamorous. And so obviously, yeah, from an ethical standpoint, that's a real problem and not something that one would want to do. And I don't think that that person obviously is polyamorous. They're just an asshole. So it, from that standpoint, yeah. But I think that people might worry that they would get lumped into that category if they don't have a partner already. Yeah. I think that's a very real fear Yeah, that, that, um, I mean, especially if you are a male identifying person, like there's yes, very, and for good reason, people might be suspicious of that. But I think what makes the difference, like we were saying is how you actually conduct yourself in the relationship rather than just, choosing to say a label or not and then still being shady and well okay you know what i mean speaking of shadiness i mean that brings (laughs) up like i think a number of times we've gotten emails from people who are like i am cheating on my wife but i feel like i'm polyamorous because like i really legitimately like i love my wife and i also am really in love with this person like this other partner uh you know how do i make this work or or what does this mean or how do i get what I want in this situation and things like that. And so that's, then it brings up kind of this other question of like, I don't want to doubt that you feel polyamorous and, Mm. and maybe this process of having an affair has opened you up to realizing like, Oh, I am capable of holding love for two people at the same time. And I am capable of 
wanting to maintain two relationships at the same time. So it's like, I don't doubt that like you're feeling polyamorous, but you ain't doing polyamory. And so then that's my question is like, then does it come like, then is there a distinction between like how you feel versus how you practice? And that gets held to a different standard. Like, I don't know. I think that's a great distinction. I was, I was going to bring that that up earlier and and didn't quite get to it. So I'm glad you brought that up. But I, I, the other one I'll hear is someone who talks to me and they'll say, Oh, you know, I've been polyamorous for uh, seven years, but only honestly. So for the last two years, Mm. And I'm like, yeah. then no. Then you were just cheating you were, before. You were just a cheater before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but I well, think I don't know. This Well, is... hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. I'm just going to jump on that really quick because okay. I honestly, I feel like I would say something like that. I was like, I felt polyamorous since like a really, really, really long time ago, but I haven't been like proactively, honestly, polyamorous for 10 years. That doesn't mean that I cheated. Like I didn't cheat on anyone when I was monogamous. It just meant that like I kind of fell into the mainstream default of like, well, I feel this way, but that's not correct. So I'm just going to choose monogamy. So I don't think it can necessarily sure, that just is assume, a distinction. Although yeah. someone you says and that, I that updated, means they were cheating. You Wait, and Emily? I have dated someone though who did cheat, like in yes. their in their, in their like non polyamorous life many many times. Yeah. And I know a yeah. lot of people who've done that as well. Right. And but that, so yeah. But I think Dedeker, you bring up a good point of sure. like it depends on what they mean by that. Right. Mm-hmm. Is it just that I had this feeling but didn't know it was something I could do, which sort of goes toward that idea of polyamory being more of an identity for yourself mm-hmm. versus, well, I was just cheating and being secretive about it. And only recently after my divorce am I being open with my partners about it. That would fall more into the category of you're talking about the practice of yeah. doing it. Yes. So that's an interesting thing, too, to like identity versus practice. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, your relationship practice. And and in that, I actually wanted to bring up something based on what you were saying, Dedeker, that I think that the bigger distinction of like feeling like you are polyamorous is not that I've realized I'm capable of loving multiple people or wanting to pursue multiple relationships, but more realizing that that's something I also want for my other partners. Mm, that's like, a good distinction. To me, that's the bigger distinction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we've talked about that before with like monopoly relationships where I'm like, I kind of feel like the monogamous one, if they are okay with their partner having other partners, I think they're the still polyamorous. They're more the polyamorous one Mm -hmm. because it's, I think it's more about what you hope to limit from your partner rather than just what you want to do yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And that's also something that people debate. Yeah. People uh, have taken great issue with that opinion. Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I obviously, if you are not dating anyone for an extended period of time, then you have to, in your mind, put these practices into place, at least in the foreseeable future that you would have a partner and be able to speak to them about these things. Like, ideally, even if you are single, you're coming at any potential relationship with, you know, this is who I am. This is what I expect. This is what I hope for you that you would get out of a relationship with me, etc., and that you are still being ethical about everything, even though you may not be successfully dating people at that particular moment. Well, I mean, yeah. I like in a really ideal world, I feel like everyone would come to a first date with that kind of awareness and knowledge, even if they were but seeking I, but not very everyone does. looking in monogamy. Sure. I know that's true, but it's, but, well, but really though, like when you're trying to find a long-term partner, whether that's just one partner or whether that's multiple partners, you know, being able to have a sense of shared values mm-hmm. is important. And I feel like, you know, that's why, you know, on this show, like we try to, to talk about conscious monogamy. I think we should be talking about it more because I think that is also part of it is like also having this very conscious awareness of your values and what it is that you want, you know, it, but it is the kind of thing that it's like, if you're single and monogamous, you, I don't hear a lot of people questioning, like, am I still monogamous, even though I'm not with a partner <laughs> right now? Good um, point. You know, usually someone who wants monogamy is still pretty clear on like, no, that's what I'm looking for. And that's what I want. Um, yeah. So I guess yeah. on that side of things, and, and I guess there's well, maybe not the- quite the same debate around is monogamy a sexual orientation or not. I yeah, I mean, I know, it generally, like, the precursor to monogamy often is, well, we're dating multiple people, and then, okay, we're going steady. Is that still a mm-hmm. thing people say? 
or sure. like we're yeah we're we're not dating anyone else we're you know exclusive that's the mm-hmm. term that i was looking yeah. for mm-hmm. yeah yeah well okay so what if what if we take this to the next stage now mm-hmm. so this person's been debating like am i polyamorous even if i'm not dating anyone yet and and haven't dated that way before or um i mean what about a situation where i am in a relationship but i really don't like my metamors mm. or or i feel a lot of jealousy mm-hmm. of my partner even mm. though you know intellectually i'm like polyamory makes sense to me yet i still have these emotional reactions that come up am i maybe not actually polyamorous mm. Dedeker, like, what would you say to that up. Oh my goodness. No, I'm that comes up, it a lot. comes up a lot. I think, yeah. yeah, it comes up a lot with clients. You know, that question of, of, I feel jealous. Does that mean I'm not cut out for this? Or I'm not getting along with my metamor? Does that mean I'm not cut out with this or for this? Or this particular relationship just ended? Does that mean I'm not cut out for this? You know, a lot of those questions. Um, and it's a tough one to tease out. I think particularly like I, like so often, it's such a common experience for your brain to be like, yes, this totally makes sense. And, and like, it's logical to me. Like I totally get this, this conceptual idea of abundant love and non possession and, mm-hmm. you know, both me and a partner having autonomy and freedom, um, like totally get it. But like my body is the thing that reacts when I feel jealous. Right. You know, that it's often your body that, feels nauseous or feels nervous or feels shaky or feels sweaty. And then that's often fed by, you know, kind of whatever story you may be, you know, cooking up in your brain to continue that. And, and like, the thing is like, that's okay because it's like your body and your nervous system has been trained basically since birth about what is and isn't okay in relationships. You know, you are the product of your environment and your culture. And I think a lot of people know who get into this, that a lot of this process is, deprogramming rewiring yeah. mm-hmm. relearning to be to be very yoda you know relearning what you have learned <laughs> um, i was just having really- a conversation yeah. with someone about exactly that where he was mm-hmm. kind of like so i heard through eric about you being <clears throat> polyamorous and doing your podcast and stuff but like and you know he went into kind of the usual questions about like but what about jealousy and you know what's, like, yeah, what's yeah, it yeah, like yeah, all that yeah. Right. But like the thing I kept kind of coming back to talking to him is just how much of the transition into doing it is deprogramming. It's exactly that. It's unlearning stuff almost more than it's learning stuff. It's unlearning things. Mm-hmm. And it is mm-hmm. so interesting how even if you have for many, many years or most of your life felt like I could be polyamorous, I don't have a word for it yet, but that seems conceptually like something that completely makes sense but yet that other part of programming from your outside forces and the media and your parents and you know saying that like monogamy is the thing to do monogamy is the thing to do that even though your brain and maybe your heart is that too i don't know no roll with it roll with it yeah 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 i'm like wow that's cheesy but but that that (laughs) tells you like that polyamory is the right thing for you that still all these outside forces are saying no that it can still be really difficult and really hard to go there yeah it reminds me um someone sent me a video of and i'm sorry i don't remember the name but it's some kind of self-help guru and i don't mean to be like derogatory towards him i mean i'm sure he's a perfectly wonderful man um but some self-help guru who is very publicly in an open relationship and Mm -hmm. and talks about it a lot and i think also does a little bit of like discussion on that and like kind of helping people who are interested in getting into an open relationship but i think his his main gig is something else but anyway yeah someone sent me a video of him kind of answering the question about what it's like being in an open relationship and he actually said something that really stuck with me. And it's kind of like, if you get into an open relationship and like your only goal is to increase pleasure in your life, you know, whether that's the pleasure of more sex partners or the pleasure of falling in love with someone new or the pleasure of just having more attention from different people. Like if you're only getting into it just for pleasure and nothing else, like you're going to be disappointed because there's going to be pain that comes with it, (laughs) you know? Um, If you're into it to not just have pleasurable experiences, but also to like get to know yourself 
and to deepen your relationships and have better communication and like really learn about the parts of you that need to heal, like then it's definitely going to be a success for you in that pursuit anyway. Um, So, and so, yeah. Well, just do you think like it's a fake it till you make it situation? I mean, we've talked about this, like all of the ways in which people can feel jealous and feel awful about it potentially for many, many years, even is it just like a continual deprogramming? Like that is the thing. You can still call yourself pro- polyamorous even if you're having a difficult time. It'll I, just take time. I, I mean, I don't know. Where I've landed on this is is kind of this idea that it's like, if you're going to be in a relationship with a human being, you're going to get hurt and you're going to hurt the other person. Whether that's majorly like huge, awful, devastating heartbreak or whether it's like tiny minor things that happen on a day-to-day basis that hurt, like... That's going to happen regardless of if you're monogamous or not. And so for me, I'm just kind of like, yeah, you know, living this way and practicing this way, it's brought me a lot of pain and it's also brought me a lot of really amazing things. And I'm like, it seems worth it to me. Like, that's how it feels like to me now is it feels worth it to me. You know, I wouldn't because and but I also have the suspicion that I feel like even if I was monogamous from day one, that I would probably end up with the same trade off of pain to pleasure, really like sure. But, like, some people would not be questioning the monogamy part in the same way that they might be questioning the polyamory of it all. Yeah. But like, is I, I this happening so. just because of the polyamory? I suppose so, yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I just wanted to share, like, a little bit personally that I found that, like, overall, the experience of transitioning from having monogamous relationships to being polyamorous for me was, you know, one that took some time and has gotten to a place of relative calm like calmer even than my monogamous days um possibly because it's a better fit like it's more accurately it it more accurately represents you know how i think about the world and what makes sense to me but it was still a transition because of all that unlearning and i know that for me specifically because of whatever about my upbringing in this culture or or my family or my friends or whatever that something that I think was kind of one of the longest struggles for me to reprogram was uh, kind of my approach to being competitive with other men. Um, hmm. So specifically if I was dating um, women who were dating other men, that that the, the like feeling like needing to be competitive over things or like being envious or jealous of things that they got, even if I was still getting everything that I needed Mm -hmm. and like everything should have been good. But like that competitiveness was so ingrained that it was even hard to become aware of. I would think it was all these other things when, as I, you know, very slowly kind of chipped away at that realized like, Oh, huh. Like that's there. And that doesn't mean it's even gone entirely, but now it's like, it comes up and I'm just like, Oh yeah, that's that thing. Let's not worry about that so much. I mean, <laughs> and it just goes yeah, away so quickly. That's an impressive amount of self evaluation that I honestly just think maybe some people aren't willing to do. Because again, in order to deprogram, you have to like look at yourself and you have to look at all of the reasons why those things stick with you and why you mm-hmm. choose to let them have any, I don't know, any weight in your life. I- yeah, if that's yeah. not what you want, I- if you want to move forward and move past it and maybe you know, and become this different thing or this thing that you weren't initially, but want to be. And, and yeah, you have to ask yourself, like, why am I, why am I keeping with the old ways? So that's impressive, Mm. Jess. That's good. Even if you don't always do it all the time, that you at least know what's happening. Well, as I say to a lot of people, and to be totally honest, end up saying to myself most of the time is Mm -hmm. uh, the thing that you think is the thing is probably not the thing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) as in, as in, I don't know when you have like, when you have like your own shit and your own trauma and your own baggage or your own insecurities, it's like, it's so easy for your brain to come up with a reason why you're upset. That's not actually like the insecurity or the baggage or the trauma, like to create a problem to fix. Yeah. Well, it's so uh, it's, I think particularly like create an external problem to fix. Like I think it can be so easy to be like, well, the reason I'm upset is because he texted me 
10 minutes later than I thought he was going to be. And like, we need to have a talk about, about our texting and like when we text each other and, and how we communicate with each other, like that's what needs to happen. And, yeah. you know, I don't want to discount like if there are issues in your communication or if there are little hacks that would make your lives easier, like definitely do that. But it does require this really critical eye of like, understanding that your brain is going to be able to fill in a convenient and safe feeling excuse <laughs> essentially for why you're yeah. feeling shitty in a particular moment. Um, because yeah, I, I think our brains and our minds don't really want to look at themselves. Oh um, well, yeah. We want to give ourselves like the Uber benefit of the doubt. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. Well, I feel like, I mean, I love these deep philosophical conversations, but I'm going to try to, to circle us back around yeah. to, um, what we're talking about, which is this idea of like, essentially, what does it take to count as polyamorous? Mm -hmm. Is there such a thing? Is that a ridiculous question to ask? And I think we also get people who come to us and ask about like, you know, let's say I have a primary relationship. Like, let's say I, I you know, choose to have a primary relationship. You know, we've opened and closed our relationship a couple of times, or sometimes we do it at specific times is that okay? Does that count as polyamory? Does that count as some other form of non-monogamy? What do y'all think about that? Well, okay. We've talked about this before, but Jason and I did this very early on in our polyamorous relationship um, because, and, and at the time, I will say neither of us were dating anyone. We had dated people. I had gone on a lot of dates. Jason like, had had at least one sort of longer term three month relationship or something. I don't even think it was that long, but yeah. Well, like long term, a yeah. like couple of months. Yeah. But, but you had actually had like some people that you were dating or, or that you had successfully gone on some dates with, whereas I was going on a bunch of terrible, awful dates and feeling really not good about things. Um, and so we did choose to close for a while and then eventually opened again. Um, and I think it is a, there's a difference when lives are not being changed. I thought you were going to say when lives are at stake. <laughs> no, no, when <laughs> lives are like not being, you know, changed and hurt and broken, and uh, you know, when when a secondary, for example, is not being profoundly hurt because all of a sudden the primary is like, we got to stop this. I'm not feeling good, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So this is this is an interesting one, and I think that like the question of extenuating circumstances due to just life, you know, happening and whether or not that's an okay thing to close or open a relationship. I don't know. What do you, what do you guys think? You I feel think? like, I mean, I know on other episodes we've talked, you know, sometimes this gets into a conversation around hierarchy and like yeah. is strict hierarchy ethical or not. And so, you know, if you're listening to this, you can go listen to like those episodes if you want more of a discussion about that. But I think at least where I've landed now it's just, and, and I think, you know, part of ethics is understanding that your actions have impact. They yeah. have impact on you. They have impact on other people around you. And just understanding that. Because it's like really, you know, we made the joke at the beginning of the episode about the polyamory board of directors, which doesn't exist. It's like no one what? is standing there over your shoulder watching what you're doing like Santa Claus getting ready to revoke your polyamory card or put a gold star on it or not. Um, Ooh, a gold star. And so it's like, that means, you know, no one's really policing you. And so that means you can do what you want. Like, if you want to close your relationship, you can. It's just, you have to understand that there's impact there. And it's about evaluating what that impact is. And I would make the argument, like, there's impact, even if you're not having to, like, break up with other people in order to close your relationship. Even mm -hmm. if you've opened, maybe neither of you are dating someone, or maybe neither of you even gone on a date and you decide to close your relationship. Like, there's still impact there. There's still impact on how you relate to each other. There's still impact on how you communicate with each other. There's still impact in the sense of, like, um, I guess, I don't know. I feel like, you know, when you do a lot of the back and forth open close things, just that there's impact that it's like, it can some, I think that I often see it results in like, sometimes people feel a little bit more unstable. People feel a little bit more confused of like, are we doing this open thing or are we not? Is it safe for me when we say that we are open? Is it safe for me to date someone or is it not? Like, cause I don't know if we're mm. going to close again or if it's closed, is it going to be safe for me to feel like it's closed? Cause I don't know if we're going to open it again, you know? Um, so I think there can still be impact there, even if you're not necessarily dating someone or like having to break someone's heart or disrupt someone's life to break up with them in order to close the relationship. So yeah. 
Absolutely. I think that's kind, that's kind of where I land is that it's like, you know, I can't necessarily tell you that what you're doing is good or bad or, or what, but just understand that there's impact and it's kind of up to you to be aware of that and, and know if you're okay making that kind of impact or not. That's, that's my soapbox. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I was going to take it to uh, like a slightly different angle, more of like a philosophical angle of identity of like, can you consider yourselves you know, if this is a couple that's closed and opened again, like, can you count as polyamorous if that's something that you've done in the past? And say you even did it in a less ethical way, in a way that was really hurtful to people. Like you did just like, my partner told me I have to break up with you. So by <laughs> breaking hearts and, you know, practicing the stuff that we talk a lot about on this show, being a shitty thing to do and not being ethical. However, it happens sometimes because we all make decisions and we all either, you know, cave to pressures or just weigh the pros and cons and have to make hard decisions that hurt people. Like that does happen sometimes, even if you're being as ethical as you can be. And sometimes we're not perfect. And so I think there's actually a lot of value in accepting that and kind of accepting and being able to admit I've done this badly before, or I've made some not great decisions about the ways that I've treated people, but that doesn't mean like I can't identify with this thing or that I can't do better in the future. Yeah. And I feel like we're going to see more and more of this as we are. Well, I mean, we're in election season now, but as we move toward another presidential election, this thing that we do with politicians where it's like, you are not allowed to ever have changed your mind ever about anything as a politician. And if you ever have, someone's going to try to catch you up on it and be like, see, gotcha, you're a liar, you're not trustworthy, mm. you flip-flop. And I think that, yeah, like, if someone's super inconsistent or says they believe one thing and immediately does another thing, like, yes, that's not being congruous, yes, that's not being trustworthy or safe. But on the other hand, I think there's a ton of value to being able to change our beliefs and to learn things and to keep growing as people instead of being like, nope, all my beliefs have been fixed and every new thing I believe I have to relate somehow back to how it's justified by other things I've said that I believed. So I think there's this balance there. Um, and yeah. so a anyway, that's my little soapbox. So we're just, we're trading soapboxes now. <laughs> Do um, you have a soapbox, Emily? <laughs> all I know is that, you know, it, like I said before, things do happen. I've known people who, you know, they may have long-term partners, but one partner might want to go on a lot of dates. That's something that they love to do. Um, but when they got pregnant, the the primary partner said, hey, is it okay if during this time, like, we not go on any new dates because I'm not feeling great about my body right now, or it's just a challenging time for me because of the pregnancy, and I don't feel like I want to go on new dates so maybe together we can not do that during this nine month period or during this 18 month period or something when the child is very young. Maybe we don't need to it completely take away from the existing relationships, but we just don't enter into any new ones. For example, I've seen that happen um, with people that I know. And then also, obviously, I've seen it on the other end of the spectrum where people completely just can't handle polyamory. One partner can't and say, you know, it's monogamy or bust. So, and that obviously, yes, from an ethical standpoint, that can be challenging. And, and yes, I agree with you that pros and cons have to be weighed and, and potentially somebody has to decide, make the decision. I want to stay in this relationship or I want to be polyamorous. And that's the thing that matters to me. Hmm. So yeah. that it's yeah, I, the person's decision, of course, but yeah, I, being ethical about it is incredibly important. Of course. Well, I feel like a lot of people end up in a bind, like let's say in that situation where it's like, you know, maybe I really jive with being non-monogamous, but my partner's having a really, really hard time. And I feel like we need to close the relationship or else this person's going to leave me, or it mm -hmm. seems like they're really, really getting hurt by this. And so of course we end up in this ethical bind. It's this idea of like, it feels unethical to be doing something that my partner feels so harmed by or so upset by. And, yeah. and again, like I'll just come back to the same thing of like, you know, it's okay to make the decision that feels right to you. And, you know, that feels like, I don't know, it's the best choice for you in that particular moment. I think that some people kind of fall into some mistaken thinking of like, if I've made a choice 
that means I'm like supporting my primary partnership or I'm protecting my primary partner, that means it's 100% an ethical choice and, and like oh, any harm sure, that I yeah. caused is canceled out. Like I think some, sometimes people fall into that of this idea mm-hmm. of like, well, I've chosen to that like support trumps everything my par- else. Yeah. For lack of so a better that kind word. of trumps everything yeah. else. And, and I think it's kind of the same thing where it's, it's like, I don't know. Americans, we love a black and white, don't we? And we love being able we to say this is right. So hard. And this is wrong, but it's, yeah, it does come down to shades of gray essentially. And, it, and I don't know. It is just that it's just kind of evaluating what the impact is. But I think that just cause you made a choice to like protect your marriage or to protect your relationship, like maybe that's a good thing, but it doesn't mean that like you didn't cause any harm. I think for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's a lot of fun things that we <laughs> talked about. I think, yeah. yeah, overall, with these things that we just discussed, the takeaway that I have is if you're doing things in an ethical manner with a lot of thought and a lot of introspection behind them, then generally, like, if you are, if you call yourself polyamorous, then you are. You're, you just need to be doing things in an ethical manner and and be having the forethought to be like okay if i'm not in a relationship now the relationships that i will have in the future are going to look like x y and z and some intentionality yeah intentionality behind it exactly mm-hmm. well i don't know emily i don't know if you get to count yourself as polyamorous just for believing that because you do it different than me so i don't think you get to be in this club Oh, I see what ge- what Jason's doing see- here. <laughs> Are you about to gatekeep, I- which we're going to talk about yep. in a little bit? Yeah, I was going to say Jason's gatekeeping, and I almost called him gaze. Like, he's gatekeeping. Gaze- he's gatekeeping. Gatekeeping, yes. He's gatekeeping, yeah. That's yeah. weird. Okay. Yeah, we'll talk about gatekeeping, but before we get onto that, we're going to take a quick break to talk about some exciting things. The first one being our Patreon community. Um, So yeah, some of this conversation that we're having today was motivated by a conversation that we had in our monthly Patreon video discussion group, um, where some people did express, hey, my life looks like this right now, or I don't have any partners right now, or I'm not even interested in dating right now. Like, do I, can I still identify this way? And so that was like really inspiring to us. And there was some interesting conversation going on about that. But Anyway, we have these awesome video discussion groups every single month. Um, if you want to become a part of that, you can go to patreon.com slash multiamory. Specifically, that's at the $9 a month level that you get access to our monthly video discussion groups, as well as to our private Facebook discussion group and discourse forum and discord chat as well. Um which has been this really fantastic place where people feel safe since it's all private and locked down and no one can, you know, see that you're in this group. People feel safe to come forward, share what's going on in their lives, share the questions that they have, or, you know, recently share silly pictures of them dressed up in Halloween costumes with all their partners and stuff like that. Um, So again, another great community. You can even access just the online community for as little as $5 a month at our Patreon. So again, if you want to join, take part in that, take part in these discussions, which often help inform our episodes, um, again, go to patreon.com slash multiamory. And another thing that is incredibly helpful and also helps the world at large is to (laughs) take a couple minutes to go to iTunes or Stitcher and write a review about this show. Let people know what it is that you like about this show. What's the value that you get out of listening to Multiamory? Because there are other people out there just like you looking for the same sorts of things who haven't found it yet. And maybe they stumble across this show and they're like, eh. I don't, I don't know if this is what I'm looking for, but then they read your review and see, oh, they talked about this particular thing that was meaningful to them. I can relate to that. Maybe I'll give this a try, right? Maybe this will be something that can help me too. Uh, and the way that this helps the world at large is that the more people are thinking about these things and being courageous enough to look at themselves and really examine the way they're doing things <clears throat> and how they're treating people, the more great people there are out there for you to have relationships with uh, and for all of us. And it just, you know, keeps growing and growing into a better world. So take a couple minutes and write a Saving review on the world, iTunes one or Stitcher review at a time. and save the world. <laughs> yes. Wow. It's, it's really evolved over time that like at first we're like, <laughs> it'll just like, it'll help us feel good. And now you're like, you're going to save the world by leaving an iTunes yeah, review. Yeah. Goodness. Yep. Wow. All right. Well, y'all do that. 
Um, and finally, our sponsor for this week is Audible. We've talked about it before, but Dedeker Winston recently got an audiobook for her book, The Smart Girl's Guide to Polyamory. So we're going to shout it out again, because why the heck not? Um, if you go to audibletrial.com slash multiamory, you can get a free 30-day trial of Audible in addition to getting a free audiobook. So we all suggest you go and get Dedeker's book. So you can, even if you decide not to keep with the Audible trial, but we're sure that you will, um, it gives a kickback to us, and then you also get to keep the free audiobook. So do it, like, obvi. And if you've already <laughs> read Dedeker's book, I did have another recommendation. Oh, please, yes. Which is a book called The Collapsing Empire by John Scalzi. Okay. Uh, the sequel to it, I think, just came out or is coming out in like a week or something. So, And I'm almost finished with the audiobook of the first one in the series. Um, and it's really cool if you're into, you know, sci-fi, sci-fi political intrigue. What uh, is it called again? The Collapsing Empire. Collapsing Empire. Um, but anyway, one of the things that's actually really neat about this book is it's in its world building creates this totally different uh, world that's, you know, thousands of years from now where it, it's like the, the government is set up in such a way that it's like a religious government. And yet... Uh, there's basically no kind of gender or sexuality restrictions mm. on anyone mm. um, that like men and women both, uh, you know, can be equally, you know, sexually forthcoming without like being, you know, getting shamed for that. And like people will sometimes lament to themselves about not being more fluid sexually because they wish they could, you know, have a sexual relationship with this person who they, you know, it's just that like, it's this really interesting world while still being somewhat religious and very capitalist. So it's like bits and pieces of our world went through without other parts. Interesting. Which I think is really cool compared to a lot of other fantasy and sci-fi where it's like, oh, we have all this technology and there's no religion anymore, but yet somehow everyone still it's adheres still, to these yeah. super traditional gender mm, roles uh, and there's still like damsels in distress and you know what I mean? Uh, so anyway, I've really been enjoying it. Uh, go check that out if you've already read Dedeker's book, like you probably have everyone's read dedeker's book it's that good it oh, is. Far, far from it there could still no, be more great. people who could stand to read yeah, it yes oh well all go right read it. go read it go read it <laughs> hey there this is bradford and this is angela and we are the atoms of love we're the hosts of by the by a raw and honest weekly podcast weaving bisexuality with swinging kink polyamory and marriage into a happy and healthy relationship we discuss topics such as jealousy, communication, and oh yes, adventurous sex. And occasionally, a beatboxing Yoda. It, it's worse than what you're imagining. It is. <laughs> For us, nothing is off limits as we subscribe to the Try Everything Twice philosophy. And we are always excited to share our experiences and advice with our listeners. So swing on by swingset.fm or wherever you subscribe to your favorite podcasts. All right. And with that, we're going to get into gatekeeping. So what is gatekeeping? Well, well you tell us. The Oxford keep English... Gotta, gotta keep it... Keep 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 those gates. Don't yeah, let them get away. Exactly. It, well, for those of you who don't know, the Oxford English Dictionary has a definition. And here it is. It is the activity of controlling and usually limiting general access to something. So why does that... Why do we want to talk about this? Gatekeeping. Well, okay. So this gatekeeping as a term comes up in a lot of circles, and I think in a lot of online communities, because it often manifests as, you know, the act of barring some kind of individual from entering into a space or participating in a discussion that they are otherwise entitled to, and is often done by an authoritative figure. And so what this looks like in real world terms is something like trans exclusive radical feminists where it's no trans women are not allowed in the discussion around women's rights or women's bodily autonomy or beauty standards or things like that. Um, yeah. uh, or things like, again, in feminist spaces, like preventing black women from being able to talk about how race plays into their experience of misogyny, you know, of preventing black women from being able that to talk about misogyny noir as it is. Um, Jeez. And I think that I've seen it pop up definitely in non-monogamy friendly spaces or polyamory friendly spaces um, because it can be very easy to, again, start getting down to brass tacks around like, well, what you're practicing 
is polyamory, but what you're, you over there are practicing is not polyamory. And so you don't have a voice in this discussion, or you can't enter into this space, or we don't want you here. And I think that's when it kind of tends to usually come up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, another place that I know this comes up is um, uh, with bisexuals in the gay community, that mm-hmm. sometimes there's this kind of like, uh, sorry, like you can't be a part of the leadership of the, you know, queer youth uh, you know, queer youth department at this university because you're bisexual. So you're mm. not really gay. Interesting. Mm. Right. Well, so that, that brings up another interesting point is that gatekeeping, it can come from within a community, like, you know, like let's, you know, using polyamory as an example, like people who identify as polyamorous calling out other people who are also wanting to identify as polyamorous for not being poly enough, essentially. Mm-hmm. So it can come from within a community. It can come from outside a community. So an example is like, women who are geeky and play video games for a long time there's been this sense of gatekeeping of like no 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 you're not a, a real geek sometimes sometimes it does boil down you're not a real geek just because you're a woman you exactly. know or no no you're not a real gamer because you don't play mobas or no you're not a real yeah. gamer because you don't play these kind of games um, well and this came up in a very you know uh political what what am i trying to say political and like press related way with all of the stuff with riot games yes yeah, yeah. And, that it was very much that culture there where they tried to like backpedal on like how they defined being a real gamer because they were doing some of that stuff specifically to try and exclude women yep Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah yeah and i i don't know i mean i think that when we get into these discussions around like what counts as polyamory or not like i think that gatekeeping often comes to the fore to the forefront because the fact that it's like I think people get really upset by the idea of like, well, you have to have some kind of standards, right? Because you can't just let anyone identify as polyamorous because then, you know, you get, again, those people who are just assholes who are like using polyamory as a label to hide behind when they're not actually being ethical or honest or communicating. Um, And so I think people struggle with this idea of like, what is just making a distinction? What is protecting a community? What is gatekeeping? What are your thoughts? I think that's, I mean, you've just hit on the heart of the whole challenge. And I think that to go back to what we were saying before is that we, especially as Americans are so desperate for a black and white. It's like, just give me the rubric, like give me the rules by which I can decide if I'm gatekeeping or not, you know, Mm. and that you'll end up with people all across the spectrum on like where they land on that decision, but they're trying to put it in like axioms Mm. Or like little definitions or little like, I can just check this box or these couple boxes and know that this is okay. Or if it checks these couple boxes, I know it isn't okay and it's bad gatekeeping. Mm-hmm. And I think the truth of it, though, is that it is very situational and that it is something that we kind of have to constantly be examining why we're doing these things and what are the impacts of it. Mm-hmm. Like, how is it impacting people? Well, it just reminds me, of this episode of Transparent, um, Mm -hmm. when that show was still happening on Amazon, uh, where they went, it it was Jeffrey Tambor's character, went with, I think, his two daughters to this big retreat uh, that was a women's retreat. And they they basically, like, threw him out of the women's retreat, uh, threw her out of the women's retreat because they said, well, you're trans and therefore you shouldn't be here. You shouldn't be allowed to be here. And I've definitely heard that from some very feminist friends of mine, Mm -hmm. like, well, they can't have a discussion. People who are trans cannot have a discussion on what it, the pain of like being a woman or the, the things that have occurred and the, the prejudice women have faced in their lives because they were potentially once gendered as male. So Mm -hmm. yeah. And to me, I'm like, none of that makes sense. That's all really mind-boggling to me that someone would go there or think that. And I, I think it's challenging, like, with this topic of polyamory, like, it, it, inclusivity versus, you know, trying to push people out. That doesn't seem right to me. Like, if somebody is interested in polyamory genuinely and ethically, then to me, they should be allowed to be doing it or calling themselves that regardless of maybe the way in which their polyamory looks. 
Yeah, well, I think it's hard because I think that often what motivates that, like like that instance with like the women's retreat, and I know it's a fictional instance, but there's definitely been similar things that have happened in real life for sure. For sure. Um, constantly. That from the perspective of the person who is an authority there and is making this call or who is leading this community, I think for some people it can come... I mean, for some people it can come from ignorance, for sure, but it's yeah. often ignorance layered on top of coming from an intention to protect the community or to improve the community or to make the community be taken seriously by mainstream by, from a mainstream viewpoint. Um, you know, that's and an so interesting distinction yes, there and that that's like where it matters starts, about mainstream. Yes, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, but that's where it starts getting tricky because I think that we saw like not long after gay marriage was legalized in the States, there was this really interesting swell of voices in the queer community and also voices of the press um, really uh, sometimes unintentionally, I think, bashing on the idea of non-monogamous relationships because there was this, this standing argument of like, well, if you legalize gay marriage, then what's to stop us from legalizing bestiality or legalizing bigamy or polygamy or whatever and so there were all these articles coming out being like see gay marriage is fine and don't worry there's no way you know non-monogamous marriages would ever work out so like we don't need to worry about that so and i think there were also voices in the queer community being like hey hey all you weirdos over there practicing non-monogamy please don't make this worse for us like we just won these rights to have traditional marriage. And so, you know, you need to stay over there and stop making us look bad. And so like, I see it coming. And that's, that's where the mainstream values thing comes in is that like, we understand that from a mainstream viewpoint, having multiple partners is weird, but having just one partner is okay. And so if I can kind of sell you on the idea of like, Oh yeah, I'm gay, but I have just this one partner and my marriage looks exactly like yours, that that's kind of an easier sell. And so Mm -hmm. anyway, that was a really long-winded way of getting around <laughs> to the fact that, like, I think from a, uh, you know, from the side of the person doing the gatekeeping, like, I think it's often motivated by that fear of, like, we can't just let anyone into this community. We need to protect this community. We need to hang on to what it is that we already have. And then the f- impact of that is often creating more divided communities within already vulnerable communities and, like breeding a lot of infighting and stuff like that, which I think is, you know, is obviously not great for everybody. Well, yeah, because we've even had it in our own group at some points, and I definitely see it in, like, the Inspired Women of LA group. My goodness, <laughs> people just go really angry at one another in that group. Mm. And, uh, and I think that it does become maybe not so much gatekeeping in there, but just my way of thinking is best and yours is not okay kind of thing. And I understand that, like, if people are obviously being uh, disrespectful or racist or bigot, you know, bigots or any of those types of things, that obviously, like, that needs to be addressed. But where does the line, where is the line crossed at even just conversations surrounding polyamory or, or anything where does the line where is the line crossed on like okay this is okay but this isn't and i guess in our own group i mean obviously we have guidelines and mm-hmm. one needs to adhere to those guidelines but but the but reason why what? we made guidelines instead of rules yeah. is because we understand that there is context specific stuff there yeah right that it isn't something that you can just set in advance and, Some, and say, like, this will do everything right. for right, every single right. circumstance that ever happens, of course. Yeah. Right. Like, to, to bring this into a non-relationship, non-gender related field, uh, that in law, that's something that's actually a big difference between the way contracts are written up in different countries. Huh. That there are some countries like ours, like America, who tries to do that like we're gonna spell out every every single possible thing we think could ever happen and then have catch-alls for the things that don't quite fit those and then we argue over those and like that's how we approach the law whereas there's other countries who will have much shorter contracts and the way that they would explain it is like well we go into the contract knowing that we can't anticipate everything that's going to happen and if there's a dispute it's going to have to get resolved but the way to do that is through making 
the intention of the contract clear rather than every single little mm-hmm. condition and thing that could possibly maybe happen in the future. Because yeah. we love so, the black and white and the letter of the law. We do. I know. Yeah. Fascinating. Yeah. So even as you were just talking, Emily, you were talking about like, well, these things obviously cross the line. And I'm like, mm-hmm. well, that's obvious to you, maybe, but that might not be like obvious to someone else. Where yeah. the, and or even if they said they have the same obvious line, where that line is might be different. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And, and I, it's so it's so challenging on like the internet also well the internet's a terrible place i think that that's black and white the internet's a terrible place no i'm just kidding it's not because there's wonderful places like our communities yes online exactly um i was gonna bring up just kind of an interesting um did you guys ever watch the l word i know you did yes we watched we watched the first season together i watched a little bit of it Catherine monag i can't yeah so in the first season there was this guy um he Presented as male, identifies as male, but identifies as a lesbian. Do you remember this character who like the the hey. women who are kind of part of the core group yes. were all hanging out and he was talking about like, oh, well, as lesbians, we, you know, experience this or like we feel this way or like da 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 And he kind of walks away and one of the other women's like, what? Like, what is he talking about? And kind of it's that he's a man who dates women, but identifies as a lesbian. I bring this up because I think it's an interesting, I could definitely see an argument for either side about should this man be able to be included in a like lesbian discussion group or a community or something like that. And that's, I think that's why they had it on the show is to kind of bring up the fact that that is a difficult thing, but you see what I mean? Like, I feel like no matter where you try to like lay down your rules, about like who can identify as polyamorous or who can identify with whatever gender there's other things where it's like oh well shit we didn't account for that like he's not Mm. saying he's a woman but he is saying he's a lesbian how how does that fit into our rules like i i don't know and again i think it just we get into problems when we try to make account for absolutely everything yeah right right i do feel like it's important to at least give some airtime to the, to the idea that I don't want anyone to come away from this thinking that it's like anything that remotely looks like gatekeeping is bad. And like all of your communities and all of your spaces and all of your discussions should be open to like literally anyone and whoever, because, you know, someone who's actually not part of a particular community or identity doesn't mean that they're automatically entitled to access any space or participate in any discussion. And if you're heading up any communities or any discussion groups or things like that, that's, I mean, that's on you to make those calls um, to bring mindfulness and awareness to that of knowing like what's gatekeeping versus what is actually protecting a community or maintaining the integrity of a community. Um, And I think also Jay, something you brought up is the idea that like gate, you know, trying to avoid the bad form of gatekeeping for a community is different from gatekeeping your personal life. And I think in that case, because I, uh, I think that's just boundaries, right? Well, yeah, we hadn't gotten to that yet. It's in, here in the notes. But yeah, I did want to make that distinction that, that he, like with polyamory, to bring it back to where we started this discussion, that if I'm going to say, well, in this community or who can be involved in this discussion, I'm not going to put stipulations in place of like, you can only be in this discussion if you have X number of partners, or if you practice polyamory a certain way, that, you know, I wouldn't want to eliminate those people from being able to participate in that discussion and to find a safe place to be able to talk about it and process it as they're on that journey. However, that doesn't mean that just because I think someone can be in that space means that I think they're safe to date, or that Mm -hmm. they're an honest person to date or that they're someone who I would recommend anyone else to date. And I think that's kind of, I find Mm. this with relationship anarchy too, that I feel like sometimes people find it and think, aha, now I finally found the thing that if someone's this, then they're definitely going to be ethical and not any of these bad things that I found I don't like. No. But the truth is like (laughs) none of these labels guarantee someone's a safe person. No. Yeah, definitely And I think that's a worthwhile distinction to make. um, For sure. You know, that, just because you let someone use a, a label or be in a group doesn't mean they instantly have a pass on everything. Well, well, I think to build off of that, it's also okay. Like if you go on a date with someone and 
you know, maybe they do identify as polyamorous or relationship anarchist or non-monogamous or whatever, and you jive with that, but the way they practice is not something you're really interested in. Like, that's okay, too. You know, I don't count that as gatekeeping. Like, I count that as, like, just boundaries and, sure. and you know, what you feel is going to keep you safe. I feel like we've had some discussions about that in the patron group recently, that it's like, you know, if the way that someone practices in their relationships or the way they practice communication sets off red flags for you, even if you're both technically on the same quote-unquote team of both identifying as polyamorous like it doesn't mean that you have to date them or have to feel like it's safe to date them or have to put up with it you know and i think unfortunately sometimes i think that's a symptom of if people feel like they don't have great access to community or great access to people to date who also identify as polyamorous that i think sometimes people end up in a situation where they feel like well i really don't like that this person I just met practices this weird strict hierarchy with a veto and, and, you know, communicates or like lets their partner see like all our private text messages, stuff like that. I don't like that, but they're like the only person I've met so far who is okay with non-monogamy. And so I feel like I, mm -hmm. I have to go with this person. Like, so I think sometimes that's a symptom of people feeling like they don't have the options to be picky about who they're okay connecting to or not. Interesting. Like they don't have the option to have boundaries. Yeah. Phrase yeah. It another way. Yeah. Yeah. Which That's is sad. Really I, I point. would I would hope to empower people to feel like they always have the option to have boundaries. Even, Absolutely. even I know it's hard sometimes, but But that's yeah, that's much easier said than done for sure. Of course. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah, I think that it's it reminds me of a discussion we had just recently, um, where we were talking with someone about the different labels like consensual non-monogamy and ethical non-monogamy and, you know, other ways that are kind of bigger umbrellas than just the term polyamory, for example. And he brought up an interesting point of consensual non-monogamy is a more clearly defined thing mm. that it's consensual means people are consenting to it and it's not monogamous that you can, that's kind of a yes or no, it either is or it isn't that. I mean, obviously, there's still a little bit of gray, but less gray than ethical non-monogamy, mm, right? Which is like, well, ethics. Like, ooh, what does that, that mean? Really, where are we at there? Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I think that's actually something worth pointing out that huh. I feel like with with pretty much any other sexual identity or relationship style, that no one seems to like imply that that means ethics all by itself. Mm. Like, I don't yeah, I mean, think you most can, people, yeah, would associate well, like, oh, well, you're bisexual, yeah. so you're more ethical than someone who's or, straight or gay. Well, probably some people would conflate like, oh, you're monogamous, so therefore you're more ethical. More, yeah, okay. That's but, true. <laughs> but it, some people, but obviously there's a lot of monogamous people who are not ethical at all, and even not ethical in their monogamy, in the way in which right. they do monogamy. Right. right. So I guess that's what I'm saying is that just because someone's monogamous doesn't you like that would be absurd to say that that means they would be ethical. And if they're not ethical, they can't be called monogamous. Yeah. Like, I think the same thing goes true with, for polyamory and we There's just a lot of unethical polyamorists. Yeah, of course. Cause th they're still people, you know, yeah. like, and so I think that it's interesting to, to think about that distinction between consensual non-monogamy and ethical non-monogamy and that mm. ethical non-monogamy could be something that we strive for and mm. that our show could be about exploring and helping people to, to do that as well as they can. Whereas consensual non-monogamy could be more of a, like, this is what I'm doing. Yeah. Just mm. factually. Interesting. Um, anyway, so that's just an interesting thought I had just while you were kind of bringing it home there. I feel like we need to have like a two hour episode on just ethics Trying I think to we should sometime. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do a. We'll do a week long retreat. Um, where uh, people can yeah. come and we'll all just, just talk we'll about just ethics. like talk about ethics and philosophy. If y'all and... have any ethicists, ethicists. That's what they uh, call them, right? Ethicists. Is that yeah. is that a real? Is that a job title? Is that a thing someone That's can a be? Great ethicist? name. <laughs> Sign if me it up. Is I want to learn. <laughs> I am an ethicist. <laughs> I'm an apprentice ethicist. <laughs> great. That's one mouthful. Yeah. One hell of a mouthful. All right, y'all. So uh, let us know your thoughts on all of this. Let us know how is it that you label? Have you been in a community before 
where you've seen an instance of gatekeeping? Have you been on like the negative side of gatekeeping in any instance? We definitely love to hear from you. Love to hear what your your experiences are. Um, the best place to share your thoughts with other listeners is on this episode's discussion thread in our private Facebook or discourse forums. You can get access to these groups and you can join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. You can email us at info at multiamory.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 678-M-U-L-T-I-05. You can also leave us a voice message on Facebook. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanera. Our social media wizard is Will McMillan. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. Full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com. Hi, I'm Mr. Pent, co-host of Life on the Swing Set, and you're listening to a Swing Set Network podcast on swingset.fm.